In this video, we'll continue our ongoing series comparing small wood stoves, this time the IKEA Hobo stove and the classic Emberlit. If you're interested in seeing how these two stoves compare, keep watching. As in our previous videos, the criteria for comparing the two stoves will be combined with two different areas. First off, we'll do the pro-cons, and the pro-cons will include things like compactness, weight, cost, and versatility of each stove. And then there will be the performance, and the performance is going to look at how quickly you can bring two cups of water to a boil on the stoves, how long the wood will last in the stoves before it burns out, and just how much ash is left afterwards. And if there's anything else that we can think of that's interesting for the two stoves, we'll add that in as well. All right, let's take a look at the two stoves we're using today. Okay, the best way to start this video out is similar as we have done in the past, which is by comparing the two stoves in their compacted states. In other words, how you would uh, probably carry them in your bags. So There's going to be a little bit of a difference from the last time we showed the IKEA, but I'll talk about that in a second. So let's just start very quickly with the IKEA. So the IKEA this time is in a stuff sack by itself without its pot. And the reason being is, is of course, the Emberlet does not come with a pot. So I'm going to be using two different pots. In fact, there are two kettles today that I'll be using to boil the water in. So I just wanted to show you what the IKEA alone would look like in a stuff sack and its weights. Now one of the things about this is of course you've got all this space inside that you can use either for a pot that you put with the set or anything else you want to put in there. You can put your food in there, your fire kit in there, any number of things in there to maximize the space usage in your backpack. So very quickly we'll set this up. Put the stuff sack aside. Turn the legs out. Add the two crossbars. Very quick, very easy assembly. All that's left now, of course, is to add wood and start the fire. As it sits right now, the IKEA Hobo stove, built out the way it is here, weighs in at 11.5 ounces or 326 grams. They are really quite a lightweight stove. I do have a few things I have to do to this stove yet to improve it, which, such as put a couple of wing nuts on the bottom to make it a little easier to adjust the uh, feet when I turn them out. But I'll, I'll do that eventually. It still functions the way it is, of course. So that's the IKEA. Now, obviously, without even taking it out of the package, the Emberlet, classic Emberlet, wins the compactness. And uh, you can see it's going to take up very little room in your space. Uh, you know, this is my second purchase. Actually, it was a gift. And... Uh, a second small twig stove. After the, the Lixada wood gas stove, which I did buy for myself, my wife gave me this, I believe it was Father's Day, probably five, maybe six years ago. So I've used it quite a bit, love it. Don't use it all the time, only because I have so many other stoves that I have to test out for videos and, uh, you know, just for the fun of it as well. But this is a classic to me. I've used this a lot and you'll see that. I do take care of it. I do clean it up after use to make sure it doesn't rust. Um, yeah, so compactness. Now, as a without the package, now I'm not gonna include the, in the weight the uh, little stuff sack that you have to have for it, but as it stands, I actually can take it out and hold it in hand and show you there. With the components I have in my hand, these come in at 12.2 ounces or 349 grams. So a little, not, well, not quite an ounce heavier than the IKEA. Now, that compactness, of course, is uh, contrasted by the little bit of work it takes to put it together. So very quickly, let me put this together, cross the hands aside, and the way that I put my stoves together is to put all four sides linked. Like that. Take my base plate, insert the notches, fold the stove up, and with a little bit of a flex, hook the side plate in, or the front plate I should say, and now it's fully assembled and ready to go. Uh, one of the things about the stainless steel stoves, and I, and I haven't yet experienced it with the uh, titanium, but I expect it will do the same, is over time they will warp a little bit. So you can see it just teeters a tiny bit. You know, that's one of the benefit of the crossbars. They're not just for small pots so that you can use them on the emberlet, but also they add structural rigidity. Now it doesn't wiggle, so it does tend to hold it in, in its uh, ideal shape as well. 
All right, so there are the two stoves assembled, and you can see why I now that I wanted to compare these two stoves today, and that is because their relative closeness in size, as well as capacity for wood. So very classic, very simple stoves, very kind of, well, relatively inexpensive. I will annotate the current price for the Emberlip because I'm sure what I paid for it uh, is a lot less than what they're charging now. They're not expensive. They're under the $50 mark, so they're not an expensive stove. Still, it's a bit of money, so that's something to think about is the cost here. So the Emberlid is going to cost a little bit more than the IKEA, and I think last time we gave it the nominal figure of $5. Uh, maybe that includes my labor in putting it together as well. All right, so there are the two stoves assembled. Now I'll take the time and I'll put some wood in and we'll get ready for the test. All right, here is one of the other reasons why I wanted to compare these two stoves, what they have in common as opposed to what is different about them. So what they have in common is not only their weights with this ember lip coming in just a little heavier, not quite an ounce heavier, but their capacities for wood. So I have them loaded with hardwood. And you can see the capacities are very similar. There might be a slight advantage given to the IKEA, but not by much, not by much at all. And how I determined how much wood to go in here is I wanted to have a top-down burn with the sticks vertically aligned. It is all split, split and cut dry hardwood. But I wanted to leave just enough room that I could get a good fire started and it wouldn't take too long before that fire is well established and we can take the test underway. I also wanted to make sure that there was the same amount of wood in each stove. So the wood I have today comes in at 12.4 ounces or 353 grams and that's just to show that they have the same amount of wood and what that looks like in each stove. Now here's the thing in a previous video I had to cut the sticks very short in order to get them to fit in properly especially in the Luxata wood gas stove. I think that may have put uh, the the uh, didn't show I should say it didn't show the IKEA in its best light what it's capable of cap of doing in terms of capacity. This is one of the versatility factors that the IKEA has is that it will hold a fair amount of wood. So you can see the sticks are almost twice as long or the pieces of wood are almost twice as long as they were in that previous video. And the same thing can be said for the the Emberlit. It can hold good long pieces of wood. Now. I have these to the bottom of these cutouts on the side. That's how tall the wood is here. In truth, it probably should be a little lower. Uh, in the long run, it's not going to affect the burn of the stove, but it does take a little while to get into a more efficient burn because if I put the pot on directly on top of the stove as is, uh, the fire is going to be so close to to the bottom of the pot that the pot will dampen down the fire considerably. Now there is something you can do that I'll show you in a minute uh, to to make that a little less of an effect on it. But uh, I just also wanted to point out versatility. Both of these stoves have the same versatility in the sense that they can be fed with much longer sticks from the side. In fact, that's the reason why I chose to make this cutout on the IKEA is because it is it mimics the cutout on the size of the Emberlin. Now there is one thing that I want to point out that a viewer pointed out and uh, it is true, it is, uh, I do have to qualify it, and that is all the holes around the IKEA, while they do aid in airflow, they also cause heat loss because you're losing a fair amount of your heat out through the side. Not all of it is being directed upwards. You can minimize that of course with a windscreen which will make, which probably you should have with most wood stoves anyway to get the most benefit from them. But there is a bit of a disadvantage that way. There is less of a disadvantage in terms of loss of heat through the sides of the emberlet, but still you're going to lose some out through the front, uh, you know, nominal, and that's going to be the same for both these stoves here. One advantage that the IKEA has in terms of versatility over the Emberlip is that you can use it with an alcohol stove with a little better uh, choices on how you're going to set it up and I did demonstrate that in a previous videos as well. Yes, you can use an alcohol stove with the Emberlip but you know it's way less than ideal. That's a long drop to put it down to the bottom to reach in with an alcohol stove to uh, well you could probably get it lit from the side but to get it snuffed out if you're using a Trangia style stove, then that's quite a challenge. And that's a long ways for flames to come up. Yes, they're all contained within the Emberlet, and you're not losing a lot of heat that way, but it's not ideal. I could modify this stove with a few holes drilled in the side so I could put 10 pegs through, as I did, you know, as you do with the, with the IKEA, but uh, I don't prefer to do that. I, I just want to leave the stove just the way it is. Now, I did make one modification. That's what I wanted to show you. So, as with the IKEA, and the crossbars. One of the reasons, of course, is to have 
uh, a smaller area that you could put a smaller pot on that might otherwise drop down inside. But also, you need to have exhaust space at the top of your stove between the stove and the pot in order for heat and uh, smoke to exhaust out. Otherwise, you will dampen the fire to the point where, well, you may not put it out, but it's going to be very smoky and you're going to lose a lot of efficiency. Well, the Emberlet has suffered, to, in my mind, has suffered to a certain degree with that issue. It does have cutouts all the way around the sides to allow for some exhausting, but it is still somewhat minimal. Those crossbars that I mentioned a few minutes ago that help for the structural rigidity. Uh, here's a little option. I'm not going to do it today for the test. I want to use it in its stock form. But you can improve the performance of the stove if you turn those stock bars 90 degrees and put them on top like this. Now, in order to make that happen, I took my Dremel tool and went down maybe a millimeter or so into the tabs there just to hold it in place. This makes a huge difference in performance. A huge difference, it really does, because now there's all kinds of exhaust room for, it, for the smoke and, uh, and uh, heat to escape out through the side and come up the sides of the pot. All right, enough talk. Let's get these two things lit and we'll get the test underway. So today, what am I using? Rather than a homemade fire starter, I'm using a very inexpensive commercial one. This is something I picked up at our dollar store. It's a wax impregnated cardboard-like material. I've got a whack of it. I just wanted to use it up. So that's what we're using today. Lit. Drop that down in the center. And I will be putting a few wood chips on top to encourage the flow. Lit. And a little bit more compact. I have less spare space in the emberlet. But that's all right. A few wood chips to get the burn going a little bit quicker. Now, astute observers are probably going to say this is not really a true top-down burn because I'm not lighting the fire on top of the wood. This one, the uh, fire starter has dropped down inside a little bit, and that is true. This is going to be something similar to a uh, Swedish torch kind of a burn. We're uh, likely to get a thermal column coming up through the center area of the stoves. Um, yeah, that is, that is true, but it still is the same for both stoves. So in terms of comparing them, I'm still getting the same, uh, the same arrangement. Okay. They appear to be catching. They didn't really need a lot of these wood chips with that dry wood. But it will take a few minutes for these to really establish themselves before I put the, put the water on, and that's when I'll bring you back. Okay, it's been just four minutes since I lit the, the fire starters for the two stoves, and you can see just where they're at at this point. The IKEA has a clear advantage in terms of how quickly it uh, is lit up and is consuming the wood. Now, I say clear advantage. It's a clear advantage to getting the fire started, but as before, I expect it's going to go through its wood much quicker than, than will the Emberlet. The Emberlet is established well enough now for me to put the pot on. Yeah, there's a good thermal column coming all the way up through the wood. So let's get these, the stoves or the pots on these two stoves and the timer started. So today I'm using kettles. This one is the GSI Kettleist stainless steel, went on top of the Emberlet. And the Pathfinder 1.2 liter stainless steel kettle went on top of the uh, IKEA. I've started the timer. Now, one of the observation right away is you can see how much of the flame has been dampened, or the fire has been dampened down by, on the, on the uh, emberlet by the kettle. It is uh, significant, and that's one of the things about the emberlet that disappoints me, is how much it will be dampened down. Now the fire is still going, and it will still come to a boil, but you can see it's not burning near as efficiently. I will likely, in a future video, now, uh, in fact, maybe what I might do is when after this comes to a boil in standard configuration is I'll add a bit of wood and just and put the crossbars on in that, that cross setting just to show you how much more efficiently it does work with those crossbars set at the 90 degree angle to their standard. Breeze picking up here in Halifax. I'm going to set up a windscreen around this so that we can get a good efficient burn. I may have to reposition the camera for you to see what's taking place after this. But I can tell already, I can hear the kettles. Sounds like the water's getting ready to come to a boil already. 
Uh, it won't be long, and when it does, I'll bring it back. All right, you know, this IKEA stove never ceases to impress me. Three minutes, 15 seconds, hard rolling boil. Now hopefully you can see inside there, hard rolling boil. Okay, let's see where it is in terms of wood consumption. Take it off. There's still a lot of wood in there, but uh, uh, it is really being consumed much quicker than it is on the ember lit. Now, let's see if I can get the lid off here. As you can see with the ember lit, my water is about to come to a boil in the GSI catalyst, but it's not there. So it will come to a boil, just a little slower. Now I know speed is not everything. How efficiently, how long the wood, sometimes you want your stove to burn a little slower because you, you get uh, a longer cook time without excessive heat. Let's take a look and see where that is in terms of wood consumption. Yeah, see it still has more than twice as much wood left burning inside of it. Burning very efficiently now, especially when I took the pot off. Let me just see if I can reset this up without burning myself and show you what it's like with those crossbars. I'm going to need a little pair of pliers for this. I'll use my little tiny pocket leatherman so that I don't burn myself. And see if I can't do this. And I'll put the kettle back on. Always tricky trying to get crossbars on after the fire is going. So you can see now that that is set up. Now, where I had it on last time and there was a lot of smoke being produced, watch this. Much, much cleaner burn. This looks a lot more like what the IKEA looked like when it was it's burning. Clean burn, all kinds of flame coming out around it. And you know, the minute I put that back on, I can hear the water getting ready to come to a boil. In fact, now it's boiling hard. So that shows you the difference at having a good exhaust outside of the two stoves or at the top of the stoves to allow air and heat to, to escape can make in terms of performance of the stoves. Okay, that took... Uh, how long did it take that one to come into play? Okay, I didn't capture the time for boil, but you saw how quickly, how long it took after the other one came to a boil. Burning really efficiently now. Now, that's the test. I'm going to let the wood burn down now and go to ash. It may take a little bit of time, and we'll just see the progression of that before we start closing the video up. All right, I'll take that pot off. Still a lot of wood left in the uh, emberlet, as you can see. In fact, I have no active flames left in the IKEA at this point. A lot of hot, a lot of heat, a lot of coals, it would still boil the water, but no active flame. So it is going to take a while, and uh, when it does burn down, I'll bring the video back. All right, we're now 25 minutes into the burn. So 25 minutes since I first lit that uh, fire starter and put it inside with the wood. And as you can see, I'm trying to create shadows, so hopefully you'll be able to see inside of the two stoves. As you can see, inside of the IKEA, we're down to a few hot coals. Inside of the Emberlet, still a lot of heat. No active flame at this time, but some great cooking coals. That's going to go on for quite a while yet. So what I wanted to do is show you what it looked like at burnout in terms of flame. But uh, it's going to take a little while yet before these are down to bare ash or just ash and, and pretty much out. And when that happens, I'll bring it back. We'll take a quick look at that and then we'll wrap the video up. Okay, so it took a little while for these to burn down to ash. There's no more active flame and I don't even see hot coals. There is still heat rising off of both stoves, but uh, they're for all intents and purposes out and I can probably show you where the ash is right now. Take the crossbars off of each of them. So here is the IKEA with what's left inside. I suspect if I left it a little while longer, it would probably burn down a little bit further, uh, or not burn down, but a little bit would, uh, more of it would disappear. And probably the same thing for the Emberlet. They look to be about equal, with maybe a slight advantage going to the IKEA in terms of what's left inside there right now, but uh, yeah, pretty much equal. Okay, these things, I just have to let them cool down and then we'll wrap this video up. 
Okay, what conclusions can we draw comparing the IKEA hobo stove with the classic Emberlet in stainless steel? Well, to begin with, the weights are fairly close together with a little bit of a lighter weight advantage going to the IKEA, but not by much. However, when it compare, comes to compactness, you just can't beat the Emberlet. It just folds down so flat and so tiny that it will slip in almost into a, a, a car, well, it would, a cargo pocket on your pants, but certainly into any backpack. The IKEA, much bulkier of course now, of course that is offset by how you pack this. If you have a pot to put inside of it or if you want to carry a pot separately and load other things inside of it just to maximize your space usage, you can do that with this one as well. What else can we say? Cost comparison. Well, we gave that uh, the winner of that to the uh, IKEA at about a $5 nominal build-out cost. I just checked before I came back to close out and this, the, the Emberlet Classic Stainless Steel is selling for $55 Canadian with free shipping on Amazon right now. So probably a little cheaper, actually, probably considerably cheaper for my friends in the United States and elsewhere. So the cost advantage or the cost of it goes to the IKEA again. How about versatility? Well, both of them, the way that I have them designed, will allow for longer feed sticks in, in through the sides of them so you can get a long slow burn meaning f and uh, you know less processing of wood. The, the internal capacities are quite close to, the, to each other with a little bit more capacity going to the IKEA than with the Emberlet. So that way I would say that they're very close in terms of their capacity and their versatility. Versatility edge has to go to the IKEA because of course it's so much easier to use an alcohol stove with this one than it would be with this one. Uh, what else can we say about them? So, performance. Well, okay, here's where things got interesting. Using the same amount of wood and the same size wood uh, in both of these stoves, the uh, IKEA came to a full and fully involved uh, fire, I guess, much quicker than did the Emberlet. It also brought water to a boil much quicker than did the Emberlet. But of course, that's not the total story. What else are you looking for? I guess if you're looking for how quickly can you bring water to a boil, because you just want a quick boil up for a cup of tea or coffee, then the IKEA will be the winner. However, if you're looking for some lasting heat to do some grilling over or some simmering over, then the Emberlet is the better choice here. It'll still bring water to a boil, just takes a little longer than it does with the IKEA. Okay, now here is where I have to give the Emberlet a bit of a hit. And that's unfortunate because I do truly love the Emberlet. And that is the design of it at the top of the stove. It suffers, in my mind, or at least in my opinion, it suffers from a lack of airflow at the top. It needs to have more air exhausting around at the top of the stove when you put a pot on top. So as you saw, the moment I put the kettle on top of the Emberlet, it dampened the fire down significantly and caused a lot of smoke to be created. And that was with super dry wood, so wetness or, or dampness in the wood was not a factor. So what can we do about that? Well, I think there's a couple of things you can do. I'm going to show you what I did, the simplest. I'll mention right now, let me just put the IKEA aside. I'll mention right now what you might do if you have the ability to do that is you could probably drill holes in each of the upright areas, these tabs here, to increase airflow. So you could probably do that all the way around and you would get a little bit more airflow coming out through the exhausting, coming out through the top. But what I did, of course, is, and I'm showing you right now with the Emberlet crossbars put in as they're designed to be with the stove. But I will show you what I did and hopefully I can get up nice and close. Right there, I took a Dremel tool and made a tiny cut on all four sides that allows me to take the crossbars up and set them down on the on the on top of those marks there and that raises well it's a little bit more than half an inch it raises it off of the top of the stove that half an inch makes a huge difference in airflow on top of the envelope so either of those two um, suggestions will work this one was the simplest for me you know I may drill this out but I don't feel the need to. I like this stove the way it is. It works when I put the, the crossbars on the, at 90 degrees, so I'm not inclined to do any more modification to this stove as I have it right now. Okay, is there a winner? No, not really. It depends on what you want. I really like both of these stove. I'm inclined to carry the Emberlet a little bit more often only because it's compactness. However, having said that, I carry the IKEA because I can put a pot in with it. So I guess the difference is if I want to use a different pot than I normally carry with the IKEA, that's when I'll carry something like the Emberlet. 
both good stoves both will perform for you very well both will last four years uh, there's no reason to think that either of these are ever going to wear out on me so i'm going to say it's up to you which one do you like better which one do you prefer so why don't you add that in the comments below what are your thoughts on both the stainless steel emberlet and the ikea hobo stove by the way i do own the emberlet now in titanium it was given to me as a gift so maybe at some point i'll compare the two stoves but performance i have noticed is pretty much identical it's just weight that makes the big difference here let me know what you think so i did ask last time if you have other stoves that you'd like to see me compare then put them in the show notes below and i've gotten some great suggestions a couple of the stoves i don't have yet so i'm going to have to try and see if i can get my hands on uh, one was the uh, bushcraft essentials books bush box xl somebody wanted me to compare that against the the uh, gen 2 firebox i'd love to own that it's a bit of an expensive stove for me if i can justify it maybe i'll purchase it if anybody wants to help me out <laughs> you're welcome to do so but it's a lot of money to be quite honest but i've always been interested myself in seeing how they compare one against the other okay let's close this video up put anything you'd like to see me do in the show notes below and i'll see if i can't work on that for a future video but until then get out and explore and take that path less traveled It'll make all the difference. Bye for now.